you want to talk about Kennedy or Oswald? Uh, if you want, yeah. I was in the Marines with Lee Harvey Oswald. Uh, all my life I've been fighting this this tendency to be typecast as Oswald's Marine Corps buddy because I always I, I feel like I'm not <coughs> becoming known in my own right when I become known as simply as somebody who knew Oswald but uh, I was in the Marines with Oswald and um, I even though at the time of the Kennedy assassination when it was announced that Oswald was involved I at first assumed that he was innocent later on because of the reports in the newspapers uh, I had great faith in the free press back in those days and and in competition and the free market of ideas and all that I thought that uh, since they were all saying that he was guilty I assumed that he was I even wrote a book to that effect I testified for the Warren Commission and I wrote a book to the, to the effect that uh, ex trying to explain why Oswald assassinated Kennedy uh, it was called Oswald it was published in 1965 and uh, then uh, along about uh, 1975 to be exact when Watergate was uh, was really in full swing I began to realize that uh, uh, these Watergate burglars had a lot in common with some people I knew in New Orleans that were always talking about assassinating Kennedy uh, after it happened uh, I assumed that they didn't have uh, anything to do with it because for one thing one of them who the one of them that I trusted the most told me that they they didn't uh, however it became very obvious with Watergate that they had been involved it was two men that I knew in, the, in New Orleans and one of them was just like a Watergate plumber and it was he was ha, also had mafia connections he knew a whole lot about the CIA he was just uh, like detailed stuff about CIA operations that hadn't been published then and uh, he knew a whole lot about what was going to happen in the future he said he was going to make Nixon president after he assassinated Kennedy uh, he said he wanted to he talked about wanting to see something like what to, we now think of as the Manson family among the Bohemians and the hippies that uh, he was a he, he he was a Nazi and he talked a lot about uh, how Bohemia and Hitler had been in his early days how he, he, he uh, I forget what the Viennese word for a, a Bohemian was back then but Hitler wore his coat over his shoulders with his without his arms and the sleeves and and uh, sat around in, in coffee houses in Vienna a lot and so on and so forth so uh, 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 this guy was was talking at that time about creating somebody like a like a Charles Manson, like a like a, a hippie Hitler, so to speak. And uh, to make enemies out of the hippies, they would have to be smashed up. Maybe, yeah. I don't know what his motives were, but he just uh, uh, anyway. He talked about killing Martin Luther King. He talked about any number of things. Uh, he talked about fighting an Asian race instead of invading Cuba because Castro is a white man and he didn't want to invade he didn't want the United States to go to war with uh, with with the Cubans because so many of them were white people that he thought if there was a war against communism it should be against an Asian race instead he, he knew so by 1975 I began to realize that this guy that I thought was a nut uh, knew what he was talking about and was probably centrally involved in the assassination conspiracy and so I went, uh, at that time Reginald Leaves here in town was investigating the Martin Luther King assassination. He was Commissioner of Public Safety at that time and I went to him or to his assistant and, and told him uh, what I knew, what, what I could remember right off the top of my head about this guy down in New Orleans uh, who had used the same word that some guy in Atlanta had used about killing Martin Luther King and framing a jailbird for it this guy talked about framing a jailbird for the Kennedy assassination and I had said why do you want to frame a jailbird and uh, I wound up saying wow well, why don't you frame some communist and he smirked he couldn't even look at me he had to look down at the floor because he was smirking so much because he knew that's what I was going to say and he was already planning to frame Oswald so uh, it was really a uh, a weird experience for me because I was writing this novel uh, based on Oswald when Oswald defected to the Soviet Union I decided to write a novel about a marine who becomes disenchanted with the US and goes to the Soviet Union 
And so it was like the hero, and I didn't like Kennedy. I was extremely anti-Kennedy myself because I was so much into Ayn Rand, the laissez-faire capitalism, objectivism, and Kennedy was the arch villain of, of, our, uh, of our movement at that time. And uh, it was like the hero of my novel jumped up off the pages of my book and shot the president. And it was, it was, it, it was very weird. Uh, however, I thought it was a coincidence. I wound up dismissing it as a coincidence until 1975. Uh, in the meantime, though, more coincidences had accumulated. I had met Guy Bannister, uh, a figure, a suspect in the Garrison Probe. I had met Clay Shaw two weeks before the assassination, and a, a discussion of my book about Oswald, the Idol Warriors, was involved. And I had met David Ferry, and I had met uh, a number of other uh, of Garrison suspects, uh, a Stringer for Life magazine named Dave Chandler, and uh, so it was like uh, uh, I had even worked in a, in a restaurant where Oswald had lived in his youth uh, with his mother. Uh, At the same time? Uh, uh, no, back many years earlier. Uh, Anyway, I worked there later, and in, in, in right around the time of the Kennedy assassination, I was working in that restaurant. In fact, I celebrated the Kennedy assassination with the guy who, uh, who owned that restaurant. <laughs> and recently, there was a current affair piece on me, and they interviewed me, and they also interviewed him uh, briefly, uh -huh. Carlos Castillo. Uh, that restaurant was a, a pool hall at the time. Oswald and his mother lived right upstairs, mm -hmm. right in the same building. Uh, so uh, there were co meaningful coincidences and meaningless coincidences, but there were just enormous numbers of coincidences, and a lot of them were pointed out to me by Jim Garrison's assistants and by Jim Garrison himself when he came after me in 1969, accusing me of, or actually 1968 and 69, accusing me of being a CIA agent and so on and so forth and being involved in the assassination. At that time, I didn't think I was, but I could not explain all these weird coincidences. And... Um, Anyhow, uh, when Watergate happened, and when I began to think about these conversations with this, this weird character, this weird, bald-headed Nazi uh, acquaintance of mine, uh, it began to make sense, because he knew all these different things. He, he, he knew I was going to Mexico that summer. Uh, I had planned to stay in Mexico for a month. I came back a little early before the month was over. Oswald was in Mexico City. Uh, he knew all that stuff, and so he could have arranged most of those coincidences. He could have arranged for me to meet Guy Bannister. He was probably working with Guy Bannister. He could have arranged for me to meet Clay Shaw and David Perry and so on and so forth because they all were arranged meetings. It was almost like these people were going out of their way to shake hands with me, and that was pretty much it. Hmm. So it was very strange. It still seems very strange to me, although these days I feel like I understand a lot more about the assassination than I did then, of course. How do you think they got Oswald to be in that building on that day at that time. Did he actually think he was going to... He worked there. Kennedy? He worked there. He worked in the building. Yeah. Ruth Payne got him a job there. Ruth Payne's husband works for Bell Aircraft uh, as a, one of the top Nazis. General, I forget whether it's Dornberger or Dornberg, anyway, was, is, was involved with Bell Aircraft. Bell Helicopter was about to go out of business until the Vietnam War. and. Uh, then they made enormous amounts of money building helicopters. Um, I realize it's speculation, but I mean, I, I can't help but wonder. I mean, what he was just there at the same time. I mean, he was totally set up, or did he did he have some well, notion he was going to? In my opinion, he was not on the sixth floor at the time of the Kennedy assassination. He claimed that he was on the second floor when the shots rang out. There is a secretary that's in, whose testimony appears in the 26 volumes that was not quoted in the Warren Report. I was quoted four times. Uh, I have known Oswald since 1959, but they quoted me four times. This woman spoke to him immediately after the assassination. They didn't quote her. She said that Oswald walked up to her right after the assassination on the second floor and said, what happened? Because phones were ringing on her desk and she was answering. And uh, she told him. 
Uh, there's a photograph of Lee Harvey Oswald standing on the front steps of the Texas School Book Depository uh, a few seconds before the shots were fired. Uh, his shirt is unbuttoned. They said the Warren Commission said it was Billy Lovelady, not Oswald. Billy Lovelady evidently looks something like Oswald. Billy Lovelady says he was wearing a red and white vertically striped shirt buttoned to the collar that day. This guy in the picture has a shirt unbuttoned about like that with a white t-shirt on underneath which was what Oswald was wearing. Uh, he's obviously, uh, if he wasn't Lee Harvey Oswald, he, he was somebody that looked exactly like Lee Harvey Oswald and was dressed exactly like Lee Harvey Oswald for, for even purposes of even greater deception in order to further confuse the public. But whatever the hell he was, or whoever he was, uh, I went and stood where he was standing. The parade, uh, if you see the Oliver Stone movie, you'll notice the, the, uh, the car with Kennedy in it was moving very slowly as it passed the school book depository. It had just made that turn uh, at the corner of Elm and Houston and it was moving extremely slowly. All right, uh, from where Oswald was standing in that photograph, uh, the president's car would not have been visible after it passed the book depository. It would have disappeared behind a concrete abutment that blocks the view uh, between Oswald and the area where the president was shot. So, Oswald would have turned around after the motorcade passed him at that point and would have made the very short journey up the stairs and would have been on the second floor at the time of the assassination, just as he said he was, just as the secretary said he was, and just as the photograph indicates he probably was. <clears throat> so to your knowledge, he couldn't have possibly been on the sixth floor firing that shot? No way, unless, unless the person on the second floor was somebody deliberately impersonating him who looked like him. There were Oswald doubles, there were people who went out and impersonated him. Most of them did not look like him, however. Uh, that would have been possible, though. That's the only possibility I can imagine. It's the only way I could possibly explain it. Any, either way, there was a conspiracy. There's no possibility that the lone assassin theory could be correct either way. And that's a pretty far out possibility that there was a double layer. Yeah. Deliberately impersonating him. It is, it is possible, though. It's within, it's within the realm of, of, uh, of possibility. Not of probability, however.